All right, welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artists Network, where we meet every Wednesday to draw together. Um, if you're new, you're gonna wanna know that this is all about us taking time out of our busy lives to draw. And I choose a new subject each week, we draw together and we find ways that we can improve. So if you wanna follow along, you can find the link to the reference image. Uh, it'll be below me on the screen. Um, love to hear where you're viewing from, anything about yourself as an artist, ask any questions you'd like that pertain to art. Um, and uh, we, again, we all work together and this is a lot of fun. So I wanna welcome everybody here. If anybody was joining us at the Illuminate event with Terry Ford last night, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, let's get to this. I'm excited to start working on this subject here this drawing of the sunflower. So this is my preparatory sketch. Um, you can find again that, that image below me of the sunflower if you wanna use that one, um, feel free to draw along. You'll also find a link to the show page on Artist Network. We also had a blog post come out recently that talks about uh, the, the symbolism of the sunflower as it pertains to what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, and if you want to see some other inspiring work, I encourage you to check out that post to share your own work. Um, and I thought today, um, what I want to kind of throw out there is for each of us to take our own approach to drawing this. You know, th what I'll do is talk through what I'm doing. Um, but what's been really inspiring throughout this whole series is to, to see how you all tackle it. So, um, for this one in particular, for example, I tried it out on some toned paper. I tried some colored charcoal, some colored graphite, and it just wasn't working for me. It didn't, I wasn't able to connect with the image. Um, and, but when I simplified it and worked simply directly with graphite, I felt like it conveyed more sense of, of atmosphere and light that to me aligned with the image, but you might have a completely different take on it. So maybe you want to work with watercolor or uh, colored materials in some ways, or maybe a different image altogether. Um, so that's what I'm kind of throwing out there as today's challenge. Or like I said, if you simply want to follow along while I, while I draw and, and kind of see what uh, comes of that, then go for that. So um, if you do um, type, if you do have any questions, if you type in all caps, I'm more likely to see it. I have the chat right here on the screen in front of me. So I do my best to manage that and monitor things. And I like to answer all questions. So if I miss something, just please ask it again to make sure I don't miss it. So, whew, okay, there is a lot there. Um, and then, oh yeah, uh, Leslie, it looks like you may not be able to watch the whole thing. And so if you are joining and, um, and you can't stay for the whole thing, this does go up as a recording very quickly afterwards. So. And if you are new, you can jump in anywhere. We're at episode 137 or 138. We have a lot of drawings that you can go through, but they're not sequential in any way. So find the subject that is appealing to you and let's just go for it. All right, and that's a lot of chat from me and we came here to draw, so let's do it. Um, let's see, am I, are things out of sync? Um, okay. Is it synced here? Is it sunk? <laughs> Let me see. It's, ah, this is so frustrating. Um, let me do this. All right. This fancy thing. Switch into my other camera because I think that was giving me trouble. And it wouldn't be a live stream without trouble. I feel awfully close to the computer. All right, well, hopefully that's better. Um, let me doo -doo -doo. We'll get rid of that. Okay. 
Yeah, that delay though, that's really frustrating. So hopefully this works now. Okay. <sighs> Deep breath. Yeah, I have a, if you're curious, what I have my, what I did is I had my iPhone set up. It's a better camera. I had my iPhone set up and sometimes because it's a larger video stream coming through, it falls out of sync with the audio. Okay. Let's get to it now. We've got the overhead camera. Again, this is my preparatory sketch. This is the Rives or Reeves BFK. It depends on how you pronounce it. I pronounce it uh, Rives. It's R-I-V-E-S BFK. So this is a cotton rag paper. I love working with it. Um, thank you for calling that out. So if anything else happens, <laughs> technical wise, let me know. I want to make sure it's a good stream for everybody. Um, this again, this and this is about uh, about an eight by ten, so it's fairly small. I'm working with graphite. I love these Cezanne pencils by um, the Creative Mark. Let me show the set if you are not familiar with them. That's this set here, um, and I have chosen. What do I have? I like to just get a range of them. I don't pay too much attention to whether it's a an HB or a B or a 2B, you know, I like to have like a hard, a medium, and a soft. Um, so for my medium, it's a 2B. For my soft, it's a 5B. And for my hard one, it's an HB. Um, and it goes, I have a kind of a bias towards the kind of the, the darker end of the spectrum. Um, and it may be different for you, partly because it just shows up better on camera. So um, HB is really a middle of the road hardness. Um, for the eraser, I have my Derwent retractable eraser that I have carved down to this chisel tip. And I have a blending stump, paper towel to smudge. Oh, and I have an extra rubber eraser. This is one of those Factus black erasers. I lost my blending, uh, my uh, kneaded eraser. And I think it has now become a cat toy because that's what happens with many art materials. <laughs> All right, Michelle, your cousin Karen is there. Awesome, I love it when family joins. Um, uh, uh, lollipop, strawberry, can you add colors when you're finished drawing your sunflower? It may be possible, um, but I, what typically happens with graphite, it's a, a fairly smooth uh, material and it tends to make a rather slick surface that is less responsive to color. Now, if you're using your graphite fairly sparingly to create perhaps a, you know, a contour line drawing and then you're adding watercolor or pastel or something, then it should be just fine. But with building up all these layers that I have here, it could give you trouble. So just putting that out there. Um, oh, <laughs> Tom, I can't, still, still can't find the Derwent retractable one. I, ooh, I hope you could find that. I love, I love this thing. It has become one of my favorite tools. Um, all right, so the the general concept that was driving my my kind of vision for the drawing. And that's a, uh, the word "vision" is kind of a loaded word, but that's all I can. All, it's the only word I can use. Uh, it's nothing grand <laughs> or large. But I was just thinking, what I want this drawing to do is feel like that sunflower is emerging out of some space, that there is a density to the atmosphere, a density to the light, and we're allowing that, that sunflower to emerge, that light to come out of that space. So again, that is my general concept there. Um, you may have a different approach. Um, what I like about this idea, though, this approach, is that it gives me the opportunity to kind of build up layers of value um, and these early stages can be very light and carefree. It's been a pretty long day, and I've been doing a lot of stuff on the computer. My brain is in a very different headspace than it will be in about 15 minutes. So in order to get to a, a headspace that is, you know, kind of more aligned with productive drawing, um, making some kind of loose marks just really helps. Um, and so I'm just kind of, building up tone in this background. Um, if anybody did join the event last night with Terry Ford, and if you're wondering what that event was, um, on Artist Network, for Artist Network members, we feature a monthly event called Illuminate, where we highlight a, an individual artist, um, and we kind of tell their story for the month. We come up with a theme for a live event uh, where 
uh, we get to see the artist in action and get to engage with them directly through Q&A. Um, we had Terry Ford on last night. Terry Ford is a very accomplished pastel artist. Um, and she, uh, she got us thinking about um, you know, strategies for building up an image. And, and in particular, she's really kind of embracing a directness. And one of the things that was really exciting to see in her work was how locked her wrist was. Um, and she was creating all of a variety of mark by locking this wrist and really drawing from the shoulder, drawing from the arm. Um, and so, um, if yeah, like I said, if anybody happened to see that, I called that out in in that event. I'm like, this is perfect. I need everybody who I draw with to see this. So what a great example of that. Um, so what what I like about the Rives VFK paper paper and and cotton rag papers in general is that they 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 really help build up these soft layers of tone. And by using the side of the pencil as I'm doing here, it's accomplishing two things. I get a broader stroke on the surface. Um, so I get to cover the page more quickly, um, and these the graphite floats on the surface more, um, and that it makes it easier to move around the page. If I shift to this tripod grip, you can see how that point now is really interacting with that surface, and I have more of a likelihood that I'll emboss the surface, especially with a harder graphite. It's more likely to scratch the surface and emboss it and create these subtle lines that are gonna be difficult to contend with later. Um, what I wanna do right now though is just build up some tone that I can then use to erase out some of the lines. Um, I wanna, right now I need to take my, my phone down because it's distracting because I have two cameras and I see myself and I don't need to see two of me. Um, so uh, if uh, Monique has a question, if so if you are an Artist Network member and you registered for that event but missed it, um, the registration link that you would have received will take you to a recording of that event. Um, and we are, uh, right now I have an editor working on putting together a video that will be added to the library. And that will be a kind of a higher resolution one that'll be permanent in the, the Artist Network library. But I love those events because we can really kind of dig into a topic there. All right, so I've got the surface toned. Um, part One of the reasons I like to do that, not just for the purposes of drawing, but it's great for that camera. <laughs> that camera doesn't like the bright white, especially when I have a studio light shining on it. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so Nia, if you missed it, like I said, you, you should be able to watch a recording of that. Um, let's see. Okay. I have, um, you know, for those of you who've been with me for a while, they, they're going to know, they're going to see, not see a, a fundamentally a, a different approach to drawing, but I want to shout out to those of you who are new. Um, building up the gesture is really an important aspect of the drawing. It's about reacting to the form. It's simply allowing your marks and your observations to synchronize to your observations of that form. And in my mind, all drawing is gesture drawing. It starts with a gesture and then it's just a matter of refinement. Um, you know, how finely refined we go or how loose we want to keep things. But the key thing about a gesture at these early stages is to is to think about aligning the development of your drawing with the evolution of your thoughts about the subject, right? So we we look at that this photograph and we instantly know it's a sunflower. We don't have to take much thought. And it doesn't take us time to come to that conclusion because our subconscious mind is solving a lot of problems for us. It's taking in all the shapes, values, textures, colors. It's taking in all that information, all that raw data, and it's 
creating an understanding of the form that is built on what it looks like, what we know about the subject going into it, any, like what it's called, any sort of past history we've had with the subject, and, and sort of an emotional pull we might have to it, what it's, what it's doing emotionally, any memories it's bringing up, et cetera. It's taking all of that and in a fraction of a second, creating a conclusion that is being sent to our conscious mind. And so what we have in our conscious mind is just the headline to an entire article, a whole report that our subconscious mind is creating about the subject. Um, and so, so, so much of the drawing process when we're looking at a subject is about deconstructing that headline, deconstructing that base understanding of sunflower and saying, what is this specifically? How did I arrive at that conclusion? The, there are a lot of things that we're going to have to look at, <clears throat> but the, 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 at its core, the best thing that you can do, the most valuable thing, I think, that you can always fall back onto is trying to understand it from an abstract point of view. What are the abstract shapes, the size, the placement, the values, etc. So try to see these not as a sunflower, but as an arrangement of abstract uh, of abstract forms. Um, and I'll kind of dig into that a little bit because you know, for me, so much about this subject is about the symbolism. But if we start a drawing from a place of abstraction. We create a foundation that triggers something in the viewer's mind for them to layer on their own symbolism, their own interpretation of that. We want, we want this to trigger something in the viewer's mind that, again, that does all that th same thinking that our own minds do about understanding it as an abstract arrangement of form and instead comes to that emotional response to it. And... Um, so when we talk about abstraction, what we're really talking about is really the, kind of essentially the raw data <laughs> of it. So imagine we didn't know what this was called. This is an entirely foreign object. We had no words for what this object is. You know, we're not thinking in terms of yellow. We're not thinking in terms of blue sky. We're not thinking of the delicacy of the petals or the, the roughness of that central head you know, where all the seeds are forming. We're not thinking about the kind of the, the rougher texture of the, of the leaf. We don't know those terms. If we think about it as though this is entirely foreign, you know, what is it that we're looking at and that we're responding to? And then from that, we're building a drawing that then hopefully triggers the inverse. It triggers some sort of emotional response. Um, and Chuck P has a great question. Would you see the same process if you were drawing from your imagination? Yes, is my thinking. But I want to expand on that a little bit. That's a really fantastic question. Because with vision, we are always working from our imagination to some degree. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to put, it, put a pin in that thought because right now I, I need to make a fundamental shift in things in order for it to, sh to be properly placed on the page. Um, I need to bring things over. So I'm looking at that central head just as a basic shape, nothing refined. Um, okay, so back to, back to what we were just saying about all drawing happens from the imagination. You know, what we know about the visual process right now, and this is true with many of our other senses, but when we open our eyes, rather than taking in all the raw data of the, of the photons of light, what all those photons that are passing in, in the world around us, reflecting off of these surfaces, they're entering through the lens of our eye, they're hitting an optical uh, or the, the, the retina, which is full of these cells that vibrate to those wavelengths, they convert that those photons into an electrical signal that travels down our optic nerve and into our brain where that electrical signal gets in, um, interpreted. That's a lot of steps. And if we had to go through all of those steps first to understand the world around us, it would be highly inefficient we may end up getting attacked by some sort of predator in the time that we're taking just to figure out where we are. So what we do 
is we take all of our past experiences of the world around us, we take the other senses as well, and we create a vision for what we expect to see in the world. We essentially hallucinate the world around us, and then we reconcile that with the optical information. We take that, again, the, 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 those photons of light that have been translated into elect, an electrical signal, we're gonna take that information and we're going to say, does this match with what we expect to see? And we're going to be primed to notice the things that are different, the things that are maybe are moving, uh, the things that are static, the things that are, that are calling to us for some one reason or another. And, uh, but I, again, I say that because ultimately all of that happens in the imagination. Everything we see is affected by the imagination. Um, what happens when we're looking at an object, however, is that we have that object to reconcile against what our brain is inventing. Um, and when I'm creating a drawing purely out of our, my imagination, I try to access that same place in my brain that I do when I'm seeing something in front of me. Um, and that is a very squishy thing to say. <laughs> it's not the most concrete thing to say, but it helps me to visualize things that aren't in front of me um, and, 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 and in that I also align with the idea that I don't have to have it all figured out up here first. I can be responding to what's happening on the page using the information that's emerging on the surface of the paper to compare to that, that sense in my mind, that imagination um, and then that's going to, they're going to kind of feed one another. It'll be a feedback loop of imagination to the page. As that image emerges and become more becomes more specific, I can say, oh, something doesn't feel right there. Maybe it's the wrong size, wrong shape, value texture, all of those things. And that informs my imagination, which then reveals more depth to that mental image that I can put on the page, which gives me more, et cetera. So there's this constant feedback. What working from life does in terms of improving your ability to draw from your imagination is that it gives you something concrete to measure and you can target something specific and say, I'm looking to develop this skill or my mental understanding of this subject aligns with what I see on the, in the photograph and, um, and thus skills are developed. So hopefully that makes sense to some degree. Um, Let's see, that was, I got on, I got a long rant there, so hopefully that <laughs> makes sense. Um, I love drawing from my imagination. Uh, I don't do it nearly enough. And it can be intimidating sometimes to abandon the, the structure that the, um, the drawing from life gives us. But, okay, so one aspect that is going to be important in this is understanding positive and negative space. Using the negative space of the sky to inform the positive space of those petals. Um, and if those are new terms for you, hopefully that clarified it, but feel free to ask any more clarifying questions. But basically what we're looking at is that in, in a, on a two-dimensional surface like this, you can use the shape of the petals, you can look at that, and render those petals. And you can also see that if you look at the shape of the sky that's created around them, that has a distinct quality as well. Um, when you put those two together, you often arrive at a deeper and more accurate understanding of the forms. Um, and so it becomes part of the process to, to really observe the shape of that negative space, that shape of that blue sky. Uh, at this stage, I'm also looking through very kind of blurred vision. Even when my eyes are not squinting, I'm letting them relax focus. And what that does is it accomplishes two things. It, it, it simplifies the form so I don't get caught up in all the details. And it helps me to disconnect from the label of sunflower at this stage. Now, again, if this, if this drawing is about the symbolism of that sunflower, don't worry, that's going to happen. I'm just abandoning that in these early stages to build up a foundation 
And at some point, then the symbolism of the sunflower will take over as the primary driving force in the in the artwork. Um, at this point, though, it's just about kind of reacting to it as raw data and thinking about masses of light and dark, thinking about shape, kind of like this. I didn't really observe that before, but this dark uh, leaf here calling it a leaf, but one way to look at it is just as this kind of you know, almost looks like a shark fin or something. Um, yeah, mad moments go thinking of Van Gogh when you look at this. It's hard not to think of Van Gogh with, with sunflower drawings. Um, okay, so now I have kind of a rough layout of this. You can see I've, I've applied no preciousness. <laughs> I want to come up with a better word than preciousness, um, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm not being precious with anything at this point. I'm just simply uh, putting sh shapes down. Now I have shapes that I can make specific decisions about. Um, and I want to shift my thinking to proportions. Um, now this is, uh, if, there's a link in the description below to the, my new book that's coming out in June. I think it's available for pre-order now, but um, this is falling in line with the general practice I describe in the book. And that came through a lot of what we cover here in, the, in these live sessions. And the idea is that how can we break down the process for drawing in such a way that we can apply that to really any subject? And the and through the through the practice by applying it to any subject, um, you gradually improve your skills. You understand those concepts more deeply, and you come to a deeper appreciation of those subjects that you're drawing. Um, the 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 simple way that I break down the steps is to start with a gesture like this. Sometimes it's a linear gesture, but oftentimes it's this building up of just lights and darks and these masses and then layering on a stage where you're analyzing the form a little bit more, thinking about the proportions, the, the placement, the composition. And so I'll walk through some of those tools that I use. Um, and then from that, as we refine that further, you're going you're gonna to build some more clarity into the shapes and then finally add the, the, the final steps, those, those details of the greater refinement. Um, so let's look at those tools for... Uh, refining the proportions. And I think what I'm going to do is work from essentially the inside out. Um, in order to do that, Yon, I just want to point out that what I've done here is I've tried to visualize just a basic shape. It gets really tricky in here where you have all of these zigzagging forms. But if you squint your eyes and you, you can start to identify just a general shape that's established by the sunflower. So I, I tried to do that. Um, I'm going to assume that this is incorrect, and I'm going to just let that sit, become more specific here in the center, and then use that to build greater specificity in these outer areas. So there's kind of like this, this push and pull throughout the drawing process where we're laying things down, we're letting them sit. We're gathering information in another area of the drawing that's going to inform what we've already established, and then we're going to refine things further from there. So, um, <clears throat> oh, uh, your eight-year-old budding artist granddaughter, welcome. Shout out to your granddaughter. That is awesome to see. Um, I'm glad that you have uh, an artistic companion that, you, that is working along with you. Um, that is always the best. Uh, so I can't wait to see the work. Um, let's see. I'm just, I just want to make sure I haven't missed anything. I see a lot of comments going back and forth and I really want to read them all, but I can't because I got to keep drawing. Um, let's see. I think I got everything. Okay. If I missed anything, I apologize. Please ask that question again. Okay. Back to this. Um, 
what I'm finding myself fighting right now is the desire to build my drawing off of the drawing, not the, the reference photo. So I need to, <laughs> I'm calling myself out on that right now. And by saying it out loud, I hope it will keep me accountable um, to you all. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to establish this kind of rough contour line of that central flower. And what you notice is that I'm placing that, that line in the center of this mass because there's, uh, sh there's shadow forms on the petals that kind of overlap that. I wanna talk about the shadow shapes in a little bit, but if, you're, if you've been around the show for a while, you would have heard that term and you'll know that that's what I'm thinking. If you haven't heard that term, hold on, I'll get to it. Um, but essentially that shadow spans the edge there and that's what I'm looking at. So what I'm doing now is using an indirect gaze to draw these marks. That means what I'm doing is I'm focusing on the flower below me on the screen, the same thing that you're seeing. I'm focusing on that, but out of my peripheral vision, I'm looking what's happening on the, on the surface there. Um, so there's a feeling of it being offset a little bit, but it also feels like tracing to some degree. It's just, it's, it's weird, but imagine tracing but just not on top of one another, which of course isn't tracing, but uh, if you can feel that same feeling, it can go a long way. All right, so now I'm looking at this angle here that cuts up and I'm trying to just find the average of that. There's a lot of complex forms there, I'm gonna, but I do wanna indicate this, this kind of notch here. Um, so now I have that shape, but I don't know if it's correct. What I wanna do now is compare the height to the width of that overall form. So what I'm gonna do with that is I'm gonna use a, a technique called comparative measuring. With the reference in front of me, I'm closing one eye. That flattens my depth perception. So when I hold my pencil in front of me, it feels like the pencil is right on top of the sunflower, even though there's a, a foot or two between it. And I'm aligning this part of the pencil with this side on the, on the reference photo, that this edge here, sliding my finger down so that it aligns with this part on the reference photo to take a measurement. And I'm, you can see that I have my arm stretched fully. And that helps to keep the distance between myself and the pencil consistent. Because if you go like this, it changes the relationship and scale between the pencil and the flower. So by locking my arm fully stretched, I can't affect that distance, I'm going to compare it to the height. And what I notice is that if I take this width and I turn it here, the height, it should be greater than the width, but I don't think I have it quite enough. Um, I think it's too wide. So now I need to bring that in and I'm going to, with that in mind, I'm going to take another pass at creating this kind of rough outline, contour line of the, the head of the flower and bring it in something more like this. All right, so um, now that feels like a, um, a better form. Now, another tool that I'm gonna use right now is I'm gonna I'm gonna divide this. So if this becomes a central axis to the flower, it helps me to see these shapes a little bit more because this is an asymmetrical form. Um, and the other, one of the things I'm fighting is my knowledge that in reality, that the literal truth of this sunflower is that this is largely circular, but because of the angle at which we're looking at this and the fact that these um, petals are kind of coming out and obscuring part of that, that head is creating this asymmetrical shape. Um, so that's going to help me to see that. And I'm feeling pretty good about it. And I want to kind of give myself a note here about this axis. Um, and I'm going to kind of envision a a, a kind of a cross here in the 
the head, something like that. Just you see how light it is using the side of the pencil still because I don't want to create marks that are permanent or embossed into the paper. Um, but this just helps me just to think through some of this. Now, if I'm envisioning this kind of a central axis that represents the tilt and then a perpendicular axis here, what that's doing is it's giving me some landmarks from which I can evaluate the, the scale and the direction, the placement of some of these petals. Uh, so we're taking this large form and we're dividing it up and we're going to divide it further from there. Um, and I want to kind of point that out because what that's doing is it's preventing me from creating kind of a linear progression around the form. So kind of starting in one area, drawing a petal, moving to the next one, moving to the next one, and hoping that they all line up. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself some of these, these landmarks like we have this leaf here. I don't know if I have it in the right spot, but I can identify um, some of these landmarks by visualizing what an extension of this line would look like. What would that pass through? What would this pass through here? Okay? So hopefully this is making sense. This makes sense to me, but I recognize that we all have different brains and different ways of processing it. So hopefully it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense and you're trying to follow along, please let me know and I'll do my best to describe it. And just know that that's, that's just a difference in, again, processing information. How you arrive at correct proportions is, can be unique to you. And you may be applying the same logic, perhaps, but perhaps in a different order than me. And all of that's good. Um, again, it's about these decisions we make as artists, but we already each have a, um, a different way of, of utilizing those. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And the, you know, the more Mad Moments Go is saying, I keep observing the photo to help me later when I draw it. That's it's so much of what's happening. Don't put the pressure on yourself to have a complete understanding of how to draw a sunflower or how this sunflower looks, it's going to take us time to discover this. So um, we let's be patient with ourselves. Okay, so another thing now that we can use are what are called plumb lines. A plumb line is simply a vertical line that's oriented to a specific point, a specific object. So if I've... If, I'm, if I've oriented this leaf back here and looking at this kind of negative space where it's peeking out between these two petals, if I give myself some more negative space in here. If I'm observing that, I can drop a plumb line down from this. Just a vertical line down from there. And what I observe is that there's another unique form right in here that happens to be somewhat oriented to this perpendicular axis that I had here, just slightly higher than that. And it's just to the left of this plumb line that I have, there's this other negative space. Um, and again, if you're, um, if you're thinking about these as abstractions, it can be helpful. Um, so, as I look to help me identify this dark form here, I'm also using angle sighting. So closing one eye, aligning my pencil. I have, I have this large reference in front of me off to the left here. Aligning my pencil with these general angles here and here. And that's giving me another landmark. And now I've, I've got this whole gap here, which is fine. Um, what that's doing is it's just narrowing the play, playing field for me. Now, the, way, the reason I like to do this, or one of the benefits to 
breaking down your subject in this manner is that it helps you to stay focused on the totality of the flower before you get too wrapped up in the the the, the subtlety. Um, and so you can, you can see I took a couple stabs at drawing this leaf here because as I look at this other leaf, the negative space here, the way they might interact, it's giving me a little bit more information. And then there's this flower here, and I may have to move this. This may be too long. And so what, hap what could have happened is that, you know, maybe I drew this little leaf here with this, looks like it's making a little muscle. Maybe that was correct. And then uh, we can adjust accordingly. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna erase a whole lot here. I don't wanna I don't wanna get into correcting too much too soon. Um, so just doing kind of a quick evaluation. I look I've got I'm looking at the negative space on top here, over here. Now, now we have a negative space under here. Um, if I look at this plumb line here that I've imagined running through the center, that gives me a bit of an orientation point as well to identify this dark shadow-like form in this area. Squinting my eyes really helps to see these shapes. And as you can see, I'm moving my eyes back and forth quite a bit. Um, there's, there's a lot to solve in this shape here, but I'm not going to solve all of that. I mostly want to just see this basic negative space here because now it's creating this relationship with this. So. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I have I've got some other things to solve. This is going to have to be refined in here. It's because I had averaged this angle. Now I need to use my eraser to add more specificity to this shape in here. Actually, I want to use the flat side here so I'm not losing that point. Um, and then I can add more specificity here, but I'm, I think I'm gonna call that area good for now. So the way this whole drawing is gonna evolve, I'm gonna make little notes, move, move to another part of the drawing, make more notes, come back around, and we're gonna, we're gonna address this area many, many times, okay? So we don't have to get this all figured out now, right? And sometimes we get to that point where, you know, if we just don't really know, and I feel myself inventing things, that's a, that's a red flag in my mind that says it's time to move and give myself more information in other parts of the drawing. And then when I come back around to that trouble spot, hopefully something new will be revealed that will help me make sense of that. So uh, Stephanie is saying, I drew a sort of light hexagon enclosing points of the leaves and points of the petals aligned with, with a central cross. That's a really good point. So like when I'm, I'm looking at the negative space. It sounds like what you had done is look at that initial kind of shape that I had established, refined that, looking at the points of those petals instead. And that's perfectly, that's a great point for those of you out there that are saying that, if, if you're looking at this and saying, this doesn't make any sense to me, try taking the same strategy, but applying it to those petals, maybe looking at um, a line that might connect, say, the high points of some of those petals. Um, lollipop strawberry, I'm not sure if you missed anything or not. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, remember saying, I, I, we all drew from imagination when we were young. Sometimes it's good to get back into it. I agree. Um, okay. Now, what's another landmark that's, that's coming out? So if I envision this line here, what, I, what that does actually 
is that takes me largely to this intersection point where this leaf emerges from behind some of these petals. Now, um, another key thing is uh, understanding that the, the eraser will be a key tool for establishing the form. It's not just a way to correct the marks. Um, so I'm going to acknowledge that some of this is wrong at this stage. Um, but we're going to bring more greater specificity to these forms. There's this, there's a, a petal somewhere right in here. But I'm gonna just make a little note there. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna move around and I wanna give some sort of note here. Now we don't have much for really the leaves in terms of the negative space to help. So if I find that central axis again, where am I? Looking at that central axis, what stands out for me is that then there's this interesting kind of S shape in that negative space and that petal that comes out and that's just above this central axis. And there's a nice broad petal here. Okay. So now I can, if I visualize this plumb line here running through the center of that head, where does that lead me? That leads me to this really cool petal that looks like some sort of scythe, um, you know, some saber-like thing. Now I'm gonna, I'm kind of, I've oriented myself, I've made this thing perhaps a bit too large. Um, let me get a proportion. So this dimension here should equal the height of the, the that pedal. So it's, I'm squeezing myself in on the top, which could come back to bite me in the end. But we'll see. I'll, I'll figure out how to work with it. Uh, maybe we just let those kind of fade off. Um, so I, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm still kind of orienting myself to this vertical axis versus this turned one that kind of is applied to perspective and trying to observe the positive and negative space there. Um, not relying on line very much, trying to look at shape. And then I'm going to just make a little note, come back to it. Um, now what happens if I go like this, if I create a horizontal guide across there, right through the center, what landmarks emerge? That kind of aligns nicely with this. What happens right over there? Well, there is a, there's a really nicely shaped pedal just adjacent along the top side to that um, to that that horizontal guide, and then it, there's this negative space here. All right. So hopefully, what we've done now is we've divided this almost like pieces of a pie. So with the playing field narrowed a little bit and we start to have indications of these specific petals, we can then shift our focus into increasingly smaller areas. Um, so if I'm looking at just this span here, if I've identified the left side form, um, I can work my way up here to this right side form. And I'm thinking in terms, again, of that positive and negative space. Now, one of the things that is really challenging for me, and I learned a lot from doing the previous 
uh, iteration of this is I get stuck um, thinking about the pedals in two different ways. One way is as its kind of axis, its central axis. So like if I'm working on this pedal here, it seems to be pointed out in that direction. But when you look at the negative space, it's got that curve. Um, and I want to, my instinct is to draw it this way, but it's actually, it's, it's coming out of this intersection vertically. And then we have an angle here, right? So we have that central axis, and then I'm really trying to identify the specific angle on the right side and the specific angle on the left side. And it's the same with this one, right? And so part of it is like, it's an issue of contrast, right? So we, we become aware of this angle in here, and that can sometimes throw off our understanding of the specific direction that we should be drawing our lines in. Um, and, I, and I like to emphasize kind of these intersection points and let the tips of these pedals become um, just less refined at this point. I'm going to discover those a little bit later. Instead, what I'm trying to do is look at that negative space more, kind of feather out, um, and then I'll, then I'll find some greater specificity in those marks. So this is, uh, it got, kind of goes into that, you know, the thinking that you know, we've talked about in, um, in past drawings about this kind of symbol system and the idea that, you know, especially with flowers or eyeballs, things that we start drawing as young kids, it forms this symbolic understanding of those shapes that we're often drawing from that versus the optical information or that, that internal understanding of really what this specific flower is doing. Um, so um, I'm, I can feel myself fighting that as well, almost drawing from past experience rather than from this one. And the idea that, oh, you draw petals a certain way, just like we would, would if we had, if we were drawing an eyeball, we often will draw from that, again, symbolic understanding. All right, and I'm kind of intentionally not um, and not using the eraser because uh, I want I'm gonna I want to keep pushing darker. The darker I go in the space around it, the lighter the lights are going to feel. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, If anybody is new, I just want to welcome you. What you're watching is Drawing Together with Artist Network. My name is Scott Meyer, and we do this every Wednesday because drawing is awesome. Okay, so now, let's see. I've identified this, this pedal down in here relative to that horizontal guide, and you can kind of try to hold that in your mind as you're going. And what I feel like is it's not quite going to fit, right? So now, without ha now I don't have to adjust the whole the whole drawing. I've because I've narrowed the playing field down. I think part of what I'm doing is drawing these petals too large. Um, So in this space here, I need to I need to be thinking about the what I need to fit in here. So and part of what's happening is like some of these lines are just getting messy. Um, so let me try to simplify it down. 
And one of the things that I, I also want to kind of throw out there is that I think it's helpful early on to give yourself some clarity around what is acceptable in terms of accuracy. Are you just trying to create a rough impression? Or are you, you know, do you really need to have each pedal accurately um, identified? How off can you be and still feel comfortable? And we're all going to have different um, uh, kind of correlations. We're going to be, or calibrations to that. All right. So I had to use my eraser to um, work subtractively, help me to see these shapes. And you can see that what I'm when I'm doing this, I'm when I find the line that represents the edge of the pedal, and then I'm I'm then kind of feathering out uh, to to reduce the reliance on line. And I, my hope in doing that is that it'll create a stronger sense of atmosphere and light. So. And as I'm going through the you know, the same thinking that we applied to, you know, these larger forms, you want to apply to the smaller forms. So, for example, when I'm looking at this edge here, I'm doing a quick check-in to see where I am relative to the, the points at the end of some of these other flowers, and the same as or petals, I mean, and then the same with over here, kind of comparing one to the next as I go. Um, and now there's a lot of stuff that's not quite refined, and that's okay. Refinement comes through the entire process, not at this stage yet. Interesting negative space right here. Comes out just to the left of this point. And so now, you know, I'm working on, it, it's hard to describe which pedal, so hopefully it's all making sense. But as I work on this pedal, what I want to do is do just do a quick check-in to see where I am relative to this form here. And hopefully it's, it's aligning pretty well, which it seems like that's the case. Beautiful shadow right in here. And I really, I, I really want light and shadow to be a driving force in this. Um, and it's, it's challenging because the color is so dominant. Um, but I do need to indicate the edge of this a little bit. and then do some subtractive drawing. I just want to make sure, I want to relate the tip of this petal to the curve over here, bring that down. So ho ho again, hopefully this is all making sense. If I'm moving along too fast, too slow, if I'm too slow, I'm sorry. Um, hello, hello. Um, so Stephanie, you're going to mask out the rest of the flower and work on only one wedge at a time. Whew, that's yeah, that's one way to do it. I I don't know how you know everybody's got a different set point, but I start to get kind of claustrophobic when I when I kind of get too tight or controlled, um, and it's a real problem for me at some points because I um, then I get this instinct to just go like this. And then, then I'm out of I'm out of luck <laughs> if I do something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to balance that 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 part of it 
Um, and part of that, I think, comes out of a kind of painterly kind of understanding. And I do that when I paint, too. I just, sometimes I just want to make take a palette knife and just go, like, or just fling some paint or something. And because I, if I get too tight, then I just feel like I said, it, the only, the best thing that I can correlate that to is claustrophobia. Um, okay. So now I'm, I've worked my way around to this other kind of landmark here where we have this, there's this thin light catching on this tiny little petal that that's touching the edge of the flower here. That's a, a tangent where you have two objects in space that are different places in space, but they're coming together at a singular point on the drawing. Um, and so I feel like this is all, so far the proportions are coming together pretty well. But I love hearing how everybody's approaches are different in drawing. That's why we are drawing together and it just isn't, this is the way to draw. This is just the way I draw. But what I find is that, you know, we, we, we're often all working from a common kind of set of decisions, but applying those decisions in different ways. So uh, I just kind of want to talk about, about why I arrived at this, this place. And the spot I'm in right now is, is helpful in illustrating that because what happens for me at least is when I focus on something, the, the nature of focus is that you're ignoring everything else, right? The, the thing at, at the center of your focus takes up a greater uh, amount of mental energy, a greater space in the mind. And when that happens for me, that object feels larger, right? And I lose a sense of proportion and r scale relationships, understanding of the spatial relationships and the scale between them. Um, and so when I'm looking at these small petals and I, if I bring my eyes into focus, all of a sudden everything else kind of fades away and I'm just seeing that and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so then I have a tendency to draw it bigger than it actually is. And so in order to keep it in scale, what I try to do is employ some of that, that indirect gaze. So if my target is, are the, the two small petals in this area, I'm going to put my attention here, or I'm sorry, not put my attention, I'm gonna focus here. I'm gonna look here, but put my attention on this. Um, and out of that, it will help me to better understand the relationship between them. And that indirect gaze has become such a big part of my drawing process that I, I kind of talk about it ad nauseum. So I apologize for, for that if you're all getting tired of hearing it. But I'm going to tell myself that that's for the benefit of those of you who are new. And they're like, oh, the what gaze? The indirect gaze. Um, I don't know if that's a term that is used widely. I, f I feel like it is, but... Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of doing some kind of massaging of the, these shapes in here um, to make sure that the petals fit for the most part. And it's so easy to get lost. Um, it's so easy to just say, so where the heck am I? And so I'm having to, to use lines a little bit more than I normally do. Um, but to me also, I, I enjoy drawings that reveal evidence of the process of its development. Um, so the idea that you're seeing some of the eraser marks, you're seeing the corrections, um, to me that just, it's fascinating to see what, what people do and what they're, what they're correcting. <laughs> I 
All right. So, it, you know, I think I'm within the acceptable threshold for accuracy in these areas, right? So, so I'm not going to give it much more thought. But again, this way may be different for you. May you may want to stick with this longer. Okay. Let's see. Now, using the eraser, I want to use this side so I keep sharpening this. So I don't need a lot of precision at this stage. So when I'm looking at this, I'm trying to think both about the positive space of the petal, the negative space of the leaf behind it. And then I'm going to make, just kind of block in some of the, that leaf behind this one. And I'm still using, I didn't even th think about it, I'm still using the HB, the same pencil. So I haven't switched, if anybody's wondering. All right, thank you, Leslie. Um, yes, yeah, Stephanie, I love what you just said there. Think of a clock face. Notice points at 8, 2, 10, 2, 4, etc. to use as landmarks. I think that's a, a really good play, uh, way to think about it. But it's all about kind of creating, uh, you know, giving yourself some place um, from which you can orient yourself. I'm going to refine this a little bit farther. So now we're back to where we were before. Again, we're just kind of circling around, circling around. And so a majority of this drawing is in this kind of ugly duckling stage. We haven't talked about that in a long time. Ugly duckling stage. The idea that pretty much you know most drawings go through this phase where you feel like you know, this could all fall apart. <laughs> and I love that point. Um, that's one of my favorite places to be when drawing is, is this feeling like you're kind of on the edge of this all just kind of crumbling. Um, and then through experience, you, you give yourself confidence that, you know, you'll, you'll pull yourself through it. You'll, you'll get it. Um, but you know, it, you also want to make sure that you're being kind to yourself and recognize, yeah, every drawing goes through this ugly duckling stage. When there's a fight to it, it, um, you know, it just feels better when you've, when you've struggled and you've achieved All right, so this is, this is really kind of a tricky spot here. Um, and ah, I didn't really angle sight, but I should more. And I'm just kind of, if, I, if you squint, right, then what you see is a, a light shape here. You're not seeing the two individual petals, you're seeing the light shape. Um, and I can give a little bit more information about these the the leaf here. Um, let's see. Find that. If I come up here, use that to help me visualize this. So now there's this there's this one petal that kind of comes in, and you can see how it crosses over this leaf, and then you can also compare it to this one that you just drew. If uh, at least I just drew that, I don't know what stage you're at right now. So I don't assume that we're all in the same spot. Because again, part of the exercise today is there's, you know, 
you know, I'm encouraging you all to find you know, your own interpretation of this subject. Um, I love that the sunflower has become such a, a prominent symbol in modern times right now for, for what's currently happening. Um, so hopefully what you can see in this, you know, when I'm tapping like this, what I'm doing is just trying to take a mental note of different elements in the drawing and how they might relate to one another. Um, kind of thinking through that before kind of striking that mark. Uh, one of the things that uh, Terry Ford mentioned in her talk last night, you know, we just talked about being deliberate with the marks, especially um, when it concerns um, kind of looseness or kind of an impressionistic quality. You know, there I think many times, and I've done this certainly myself when I was learning, you know, you'd see an artist who is loose, has loose work, and you're like, I love that. There's something I'm responding to in the, the mark making, and you kind of go for that. Um, and we got on the topic yesterday in the in the Zoom event of really identifying that what's underneath the looseness is um, a clear understanding. Uh, there's a decisiveness in the mark that's being executed in a loose way. Um, all right, so there's this. I need to, again, do some subtractive drawing now. Looking at this shape of light here. And there's a shadow-ish thing. Another shadow that crosses over. There's a really interesting play between light and dark in some of these forms. So take your time. If you're kind of struggling with the accuracy and you feel like you're just is getting overwhelmed or lost, um, take a break. Step back from your work, looking at it from a distance, flipping it upside down, looking at it in the mirror. All of those things can be helpful ways. What you're doing is you're changing your the relationship between you and the and the drawing. And when you do that, it's likely to trigger something in the brain that says, "Oh, this is what's off." Um, it, it kind of breaks us from that uh, whatever desire there might be to kind of become myopic in a way and not really see the, you know, the, the drawing for what it is. All right, so now I'm looking at a shape of this negative space in here. And again, I got to remind myself or kind of check in with my predetermined threshold for accuracy. You know, is how close do I need to get for me to feel good about it? It's basically what I'm asking myself. So, sorry. I'm, if my, my language is a little broken or anything like that, I apologize. Trying to calculate and talk at the same time or it can be very difficult. <laughs> That's what makes this so much fun. But going back to Van Gogh that was mentioned earlier, you know, it's hard not to, to draw a sunflower and not think of Van Gogh. Um, you know, so much of what's 
you know, we're responding to in those works is um, it's the honest reaction to the form, and it's not necessarily an optical response. It's not about auto, what it looks like. It's something else. Um, and I'm not a, a, an art historian or anything like that to be able to speak much more intelligently than that. So, But uh, it does bring up the idea that next week we're going to be working on a different subject. After that will be the next in the series of the we call the Art of the Steel, where we're working on master copies. So we'll be looking at a Van Gogh drawing to see how what we can learn about the artist by decoding those marks. All right. So I like to do this, just kind of soften the drawing, kind of wipe it down. Holy smokes. Getting a... Uh, I don't know. I need to take a break. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Chuck P is saying, I know we've covered this topic in prior sessions, but wouldn't this type of draw drawing be a perfect fit for the grid approach? Yeah, I think a grid is um, is a good way to think. Uh, it's, you know, it's certainly a, a good tool to use. Um, I have a resistance to them personally, um, in, in part because it. I find that it it brings me out from looking at the form specifically, and it pulls me into looking at individual blocks. Right. It. it um, I have a hard time kind of releasing my own mind from the grid and making connections across the form. And instead, I'm focusing so much on the grid that I, I don't feel like I'm connecting to the, the subject. And there's kind of two ways to think about a grid, though. There's um, when, you, when you grid up the reference photo, you can look at what's within each grid, or you can look at the lines, and you can see how the lines connect various elements in the drawing. And to me, it's all about making those connections. Um, and so if you are using a grid, I would kind of encourage you to, to contemplate the, the relationship between those two things. Um, and so if you are, like I said, if you are using a grid, I think it's a perfectly valid tool to use. It's just something that I, um, I choose not to uh, for those reasons that I, I described. Um, and in it, but in a way, by kind of breaking up the drawing the way I did, that's it, in essence creating a um, a comparable kind of experience. You know, I do I do need like a cup of tea or something, a coffee. It's a little bit late in the day because I do. Uh, Mad Moments go saying I should have a cup of coffee or something, but I I try to cut caffeine off at noon, and. Uh, sometimes it can't do it. All right. I feel like I've, I've given plenty of attention to the, uh, the, the petals now. And now I'm going to switch back to the, the center. This is going to be an interesting one. Um, so when I squint, it helps to reveal what's ultimately important about the form value-wise. Um, and I think what I want to do is... You know, I still have the lines visible, but I'm not going to worry about erasing them. I'm going to see what naturally kind of just disappears as I smudge and as I build up layers, right? So I try to I try not to use an eraser until I have a specific form that I can respond to, um, and and the, sometimes it just gets to the point where I it's too much of a mess and I need to bring out an eraser to clean it up, but. Um, so what I'm going to do is I think I, I want to continue to darken this whole area. Part of what I'm doing while I'm darkening this is like the, 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 the first thing that was revealed to me to do was that this is too light in value. So even at the lighter areas in the, the head there, I think I need to go a little bit darker. So that's what I'm doing. Um, and while I'm doing this, because it doesn't require too much thought, it allows me to come up with a game plan um, and figure out how I want to approach this. All right. Um, now what I want to do is we can see a distinction um, in value in that, that head. There's a distinct shape in here. Um, now, I want to make sure that I'm not creating a contour line in any of this. 
So I'm just using the side of the pencil in this kind of circular mark to identify these light and dark shapes. So still squinting. Um, you know, and I, uh, this, this is going to be a lot of fun because I'm, I'm seeing the pattern, kind of this, the symmetry, the beauty in the head of the sunflower, these radiating, radiating lines that all kind of overlap. And I want to draw it, but I'm not ready for it yet. I need to set the foundation for it. Um, it's like when drawing a portrait, you know, that you're wanting to get sucked into the eyes. All right, so I'm just trying to observe the form, and oftentimes it's, e it's actually easier to look at the smaller thumbnail for reference um, rather than um, use the a larger one. So if you are working from a, a, the full scale reference, you know, try shrinking it down and seeing what information is revealed to you about the form by doing that. Should be similar to um, uh, should be similar to squinting. All right. So as I'm, what I'm noticing is that this this side here has less distinct edges, but as I get over here, it really becomes sharpened. So I'm going to kind of refine some of these shapes. Looking at the negative space, not the shape of the the petals here. I do need to kind of erase it, but I'm I'm trying to erase with a mindset that I'm what I'm ultimately doing is refining the dark space, not drawing the petal. As I come down here. I can look more critically at the positive and negative spatial relationships between the petal and that head there. And then I want to, I don't want to use a line too much. I'm just going to kind of feather these marks out. All right, sorry, that was requiring a bit more brain power. <laughs> so I, that shut down the, the verbal part of my mind for a second. Um, okay, giving myself some notes in some of these areas here. All right, now, you know, this is the, still a 2B. I know I can get darker with the, the 5B pencil as well. But I'm not quite ready for that. Um, I want to just kind of refine those shapes. And so as I'm going through, you know, one of the things that I talked with Terry about, and we've talked about this in the show, is, if, you know, if I can, you know, if, if somebody said, all right, I, give me two things to focus on to improve my drawing. The two things that I would identify, I would say to look at the shape, ask yourself, what is the shape I'm drawing? And what direction do I need to make those marks? And that can give you that can get you so far. You know, that's not all there is to do in drawing, but it can take you a long way if you just focus on those things. So I'm trying to do that here by, you know, I'm squinting, but I'm thinking, oh, like just reacting to an initial impulse that says, what direction do I need to make these marks? Okay. Um, because I want to suggest something of that underlying pattern, but I don't have time to really get into the um, all the the complexity in there. You know, if, a few more hours or something, and I might really dial it in. But um, right now, I just want to make sure that there's a kind of a shadow shape and a light side. So now, what I can do? Oh, I forgot this shadow in here. It's a weird shape. There's this 
I love this this pattern. It's like this pinwheel effect of the sunflower seeds. And they run in multiple directions. It's such a complex pattern. And it makes me wonder, like, why? <laughs> uh, but, like, how did that happen? Um, it's one of those things in nature that you look at and you're like, that is amazing. Um, and so I'm, and I'm trying to be suggestive of it rather than too explicit with it. Um, as we come down here, we can start to see that it kind of opens up a little bit. But without really calculating, I'm just holding those rough observations in my mind and trying to make quick kind of notes about the the uh, kind of that again that pinwheel effect. Up here, it gets challenging to see, but I think kind of the dominant um, pattern kind of comes out like this from the center. I can see why people draw and paint flowers because they're such beautiful forms. They're really just fascinating. Okay. And he is saying, I stopped drinking coffee over a decade ago for health reasons. Never looked back. Nice. I didn't start till I was in my 30s. <laughs> and it was a life changer. I need to uh, I need to manage it better, though. Um, all right. Doug's trying to cut down, too. Oh, uh, someone with the cool... What is that? I don't know. Turtle leaf look at thing in your name there. Welcome. I'm happy to shout you out. Where are you viewing from? Someone... All right, let's see. I'm going to I'm going to bring out the darker, the five B. Um, and I, every time I say B, and then I, it just kind of reminds me of the you know, drawing a sunflower, and that makes me think of bees. I'm just going to move kind of quickly again, kind of squinting. Most of it squinting, and then with very kind of quick, sharp, kind of attacks in the vision in a way when I have area, an area that I know I want to get information from. I don't know, I, I feel like um, somebody just watching me or anybody draw, I love it in drawing classes, when you go around and you just see people making like scowling and they're making all these scrunchy faces. <laughs> and I just feel like, I wonder what that's like for people who don't, you know, know what's happening. Um, I don't know if anybody of you have had that experience. I loved it when we would, you know, assign like a self-portrait or something for an assignment. And, um, and he, every, you know, we're putting up the drawings and I'm like, boy, a lot of them look, everybody looks angry. I'm like, no, we're not angry. We're focused. You're kind of really studying and focusing. And then it puts this scowl on our faces. Like, um, you know, why is everybody so serious? Well, it's hard to hold a smile for a long time, and it's it's hard to smile and focus at the same time. So if anybody's joining and you're watching and we're just making silly faces, or if you see an artist out on the street somewhere and they're making silly faces, it's all part of the process. They're not angry. It's just sometimes what you need to do, you need to manipulate your eyes to get the information that's valuable to you. All right. Um, don't, I think I'll need to come in with this a bit more. I don't like what's happening in here. Um, but I, so I need to keep working it. And then maybe what I need to do is manipulate it with the eraser a little bit, because in, in particular what kind of stands out are these little flicks of light that are catching on the end of these things. I don't know how many of you have grown sunflowers, but I know in the past, make, you know, planting a bunch, and yeah, you know, we had a bunch of sunflowers growing all around the sandbox. 
And then if you don't get to the seeds in time, boy, that makes a lot of baby sunflowers. <laughs> they grow fast. Um, here in Colorado, you see wild sunflowers. They'll just take over a whole field. It's beautiful. Um, um, so kind of what I'm doing in something that's complex like this, you know, there's, there's kind of two overall strategies. And... Um, and you may all fall in different places on this strategy, but you know you can you can use this and say like I really need to focus, narrow things down, take one little seed thing at a time, and really get in there and understand it. Or you can kind of do what I'm doing, which is I'm just stabbing. I feel like I'm just throwing darts at this thing to see what works, um, and reacting to the form, saying, ooh, I don't know what that said, but just starting to make a mess in a way. And uh, and seeing if in the end it's accumulating together to create the impression of something that kind of makes sense, you know, especially of the, does it feel like the sunflower? Does it, can we accept it without getting caught up in the fact that all I've done is make an abstract mess here in the beginning, in the middle. Um, random guy, I'm new to this channel. Do you provide some kind of tutorials? Fantastic flower, by the way. All right, welcome, random guy. Um, yeah, we've been doing this. So what you're watching is drawing together. So it's a show where we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. Um, this is episode 136. 137, 138, one of those two, 136. Um, each week we select a new subject to draw and it's designed to help us simply improve our drawing. Um, so we, we alternate um, charcoal and graphite. Um, I've done a, just a couple pen and ink drawings in this and some tinted charcoal. Um, but you know, every week we, you know, I take the risk that it could all just be a hot mess that turns out on the page um, because that's just what happens when you draw. You never, you never really know if it's going to work. And that is part of the practice to challenge yourself in particular ways. Okay. Uh, do -do -do. So, um, yeah, and we have a lovely uh, group here. People are very nice to one another. Um, and then, yeah, if you do want to follow along, um, you, can, you can find the show page on Artist Network or in the description below, there should be a bit.ly link that takes you right to this reference. And so, yeah, and then if you're done and you want to share it on Artist Network, you can. Um, um, yeah, like Dita says, yeah, like... It, well, every now and then we get somebody on who likes to hijack the, the chat with something, but I don't know. So far, we, for the number of videos that we've put together here, it's, we've, we've been pretty lucky. All right, actually, I think what I want to do now is I'm going to use my drawing, my blending stump here. You can see that I've kind of lost some of the forms here, and I'm just going to pick any kind of random petal and start kind of blocking in some of these light and dark values. Now, with this particular technique, you know, you can see that I'm using this overhand grip, and I like to put pressure here. There's a bit of kind of a camber to the, the blending stump that allows me to kind of rock it a bit, because I don't want to have kind of hard lines. All right, I'm just thinking about blocking in the shapes of these shadows, try to identify them. And it can be helpful to really, you know, just take a moment, make a strike with your material, move on to another one, make sure that you're making a distinct observation. Um, because, and I, I kind of say that for my own benefit, because I don't know as if this is a problem for everyone, but my problem tends to be I get to, I just start running away with my marks, <laughs> um, where I, uh, you know, it you can get it. It's so easy to get absorbed into the mark making, 
that we stop looking, right? Um, and I found that to be particularly true with the blending stump. And I'm now I'm intentionally using the blending stump to bring in the darks. I'm going to be erasing out the highlights in a little bit, which is when everything should really come into view. But I'm choosing to do the darks because the darker I go in the drawing, the more I key it to a darker value, the, um, the more intense the highlights are going to be. Um, so right now, there's not a lot of clarity in the edges, and we're going to use the eraser to help sharpen those up. Um, and right now I'm trying not to get lost in all the petals and try to make sure before I make the mark, do I know where I am? Am I oriented properly? And at least in the, roughly the correct spot. And now, you know, you can see that I'm working around in a linear way because I've established a framework that I can rely on. And I'm thinking just really about shapes of light and shadow. Now, one of the things that we talked about, I talked about earlier, and I said I would bring it back up, is the idea of the shadow shape. Um, you know, again, for, for those of you who have been with the show for a while, you've heard this term, so you can just kind of keep on going. But if you're new, um, one of the things that can be really helpful to identify are the three key terms that refer to, that we want to refer to when we're creating a sense of light and shadow. Um, there is a, there's a, a term called the form shadow, there's what's called the cast shadow, and then there's the shadow shape. So the form shadow is, that's the, that's the shaded side of the object. So let's look at this section down here right now. If we're looking at this petal, you know, it's in shadow, and then there's a dis, um, distinct line where it turns into light. That line indicates that that's not actually a form shadow, that's a cast shadow. One of these other petals is casting a shadow onto this form. This shadow up here, the backside of it, where it's facing away from the light, is in shadow. That's the form shadow. And then when we look over here, we see kind of a combination of the two where we see this part here, which is the form shadow, where we have a light side of the petal, the shaded side of the petal, but it's also casting a shadow onto the head of the sunflower. And then when you put those together, you get what's called the shadow shape. And do you want to try to think about how those overlap? When you're prioritizing value structure, Uh, you're, you're, you want to be thinking about it in terms of drawing the shadow shape um, and not kind of, kind of breaking up those two forms and then shading this side and then shading this side. You want to think about what is common between them, the, drawing that shadow that overlaps them, and then we can further divide if we need to. So hopefully that makes sense. And um, now, one of the reasons that I'm, again, uh, while I'm, why I'm doing this stage now, I'm not erasing out the highlights yet, is that this blending stump can be a rather imprecise tool. Um, and when I bring in the eraser, I'm going to be able to get more precision with that, and then it'll actually refine some of these shapes that I'm making. And by, by doing this, kind of building everything up all at once, I can choose where I want to refine things further. Um, I, I, I kind of made the decision that I, I don't want to have everything brought up to the same degree, but I don't know which area I want to have um, resolved more than the others, where I essentially want more detail than others. Um, so I'm going to be reacting to that as I as I bring this into... And the completion more. Okay. So now, 
I've got my eraser here. I'm going to half shave down to this chisel tip, and I'm going to use this to refine some of these forms. First, I'm going to orient myself, make sure I'm in the right spot. I seem to be compelled to capture this particular um, petal. I'm going to use the eraser to refine that. And uh, the, the key thing here is kind of being clear on the shape, being clear on the direction. We talked about this before, right? You know, think about shape and direction, and then um, find the pressure that works. Uh, so I generally start with a kind of a lighter pressure and then increase it. Um, all right, so I'm glad that the uh, descriptions of the shadow structures are helpful. Um, and it's, I, I think it, one of the things that I also want to kind of point out, and we, we've talked about this in other subjects, is try to think about how, um, how this subject might help you with other forms, right? Um, you know, so if you are primarily focused on improving your figure drawing, for example, drawing a, a form like this can be really helpful, you know, and it's establishing a foundation for your decision making. Um, and you end up making very similar decisions in, in figure drawing about transitions from light to shadow, about form, positive and negative space. Etc. Now, one of the other things too is that this, and without color, um, I'm kind of getting lost in the value relationships between that blue sky and then some of the shadow forms. So I'll have to figure out how to address that. But this has been a lot of fun so far. Um, Jackie, I believe that was you that reached out, uh, I think, to suggest that a sunflower. So I thank you for that. We, there's another sunflower drawing um, in at one of the earlier episodes, somewhere in the 30s, like 35 or something, 38, I can't remember. Um, but that was done in charcoal. That was the other driving force for me to select graphite for this. Um, but you can, you know, hopefully apply this to any any medium that you want. What? Okay, I've got I got lost in some of these things. I'll have to I'll have to clean that up in some areas, and I'm also I'm not worried about you know getting back to the bright white. I think there's something beautiful about these gray tones that read as white um, because of the contrast um, to the values around it. So again, one of the things that we've talked about in this show a lot is that. You know, values are all about relationships. You know, it's, we, we don't have the physical ability to interpret a, a value, how light or dark something is, in isolation. Um, it's all a, it's all calibrated to the relationship. How is it lighter than or darker than the thing next to it? And um, and so this feels white, even though there's a, a nice tone to it. Um, but what I like about that is sometimes when it's the bright white of the page, that area feels like it's, it doesn't quite have enough substance. Um, 
and so I prefer to key everything a little bit darker so that those lights actually have a tone. And you do that in, in painting as well, um, allowing you know the white breakers of waves to be a just a light blue, for example. Or clouds actually being a specific hue of yellow or orange or violet. Oh, these are beautiful, um, beautiful forms there that I'm going to refine a little bit farther with the with the with the pencil there. Okay. Here, just gotta. There, I think I have now. Now the next pass has been made, where we're gradually refining this. They get rid of all the eraser detritus. Um. All right. Well, my saying is encouraging me that you describe getting lost in the midst of your drawing process. That happens to me all the time, and I thought that it was the only one who did that. No. Oh my gosh, being oriented, staying oriented is really a, a key thing, especially when it's a complex form. Um, I think I talked about it before, is that what I'll sometimes do is I'll physically point to an area I'm working on in the reference or if I'm working from life, and I'll keep my hand there so that I know how to come back to it when I get when I turn my head to make an observation, because it's so easy just to, to totally get lost. Um, uh, Jackie is episode 29. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, and then now Stephanie is talking about adding more shadows. So that's where I'm at right now is I'm going to be deepening some of these shadows now that I went through with the with the blending stump. Um, the first step, though, is I'm going to refine some of these areas here where the negative space is really prominent against these darker areas. And I'm going to use this overhand grip so that I retain a sharper point. And you know, one of the things that I try to contemplate is kind of edge variation. Um, and trying to find that point at which, you know, we, um, if we have enough refined and sharpened edges, we kind of fill in the rest of the information. Um, and that took me a long time to, to understand. I, um, I would work with very hard edged, you know, colors and values in both my drawings and my paintings. Um, and, uh, when, without that variation, you know, I didn't really, I didn't realize how overwhelmed the drawing was. And I wasn't allowing the the viewer's mind to play kind of a role in filling in that information. So by leaving some areas un, unfinished, kind of like unfocused, um, those unfocused areas, a lot of times the viewer's mind will try to fill that in. All right, so let me think here. I'm gonna, gonna stay focused on, again, these negative spaces, getting those leaves established. It also gives me a nice dark value to contrast against the, the head, which I don't think is working, but it may not be working because I don't have these darker areas established to provide the necessary contrast. And I do want to be mindful of the direction of my marks. So you saw that I kind of created that contour line there. That's pretty dangerous to do. Um, and I want to make sure that as I fill this in, that I'm running my marks in a direction that contrasts the angle of the 
petal that I'm drawing, that helps to reinforce the spatial relationships more. So what I mean by that is if, say we have this negative space here, um, and if I run my marks in this direction in parallel with that edge, what happens is the viewer's mind perceives that these lines are running in the same direction as that edge, and because they're running in the same direction, they must belong together. So it flattens out the space. By running them in different directions, that's the cue for the, the mind to say, oh, those are two different objects entirely. Um, and that's important to understand, too, when you're trying to unify a form. So, for example, if, if I'm shading in this, this section of the leaf, or this whole leaf, and I run some marks this direction, and then I change in this direction, we'll pick that up and we'll say, well, what, what caused that change in direction? They must be two separate objects. Um, and if you want to unify them, consider the direction of your marks. It's, a, it's one of those little things that, that sometimes we overlook um, in our work, but can make a big difference in, in how we perceive it. Um, so here, I, we're actually changing planes, so you can change direction of the marks. And darken this a little bit. And that gives me a little bit of contrast there to start kind of suggesting that leaf. Uh, I'm just going to kind of quickly sketch in um, you know, some of this. I don't want this, I don't have time to really refine that, but I do really need that value structure. Where are we here? Over here, there's this really cool little um, leaf form. Okay. Uh, Diana's saying sometimes I think I'm done and I go away, but then just before bedtime, I check in on my work, and the next thing I realize, it's two or more hours have gone by. <laughs> I totally get that. One more thing I gotta fix. One more thing. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Um, it happens. Yeah, I, I think the you know, definitely that feeling of having you know stepping away it can be so revealing. Um, okay, let's see. Now I want to. I'm going to just be really mindful of the lines. I think I do want some contour lines in here. Like so, right in here, I establish that contour line that doesn't really exist. And I'm going to refine that shadow a little bit. So now that I have kind of a rough placement of the shadows using the blending stump, um, I, can, I can deepen them using the, the pencil. Uh, so here's a cast shadow from this petal onto this one. We come over here, now there's a form shadow. Um, and be mindful with these form shadows about the edges. So if you look at this, for example, it goes into this crease where you have a sharper edge, and then it really kind of feathers out to that side. And that's really helpful in establishing an understanding of um, the, that, what that shadow is doing. Kind of moving my way down now. Here's another cast shadow. We're just kind of lightly catching that. And then form shadows in here. I feel like using contour lines more than I normally do. In the preparatory one, I didn't really use contour lines around the edges. Um, but that's part of the drawing process. I'm, I'm 
making a decision on the fly. Now, the, the thing that I like to focus more on when I'm using these contour lines, so again, a contour line is a line that defines the edge of a three-dimensional object, and that three-dimensional quality is really key to it. You want to create a line that, um, you know, as an effective contour line, it will reinforce its three-dimensional quality, not flatten it out. Otherwise, then what, what you have is an outline. And, and you may, you know, for stylistic purposes, choose to have a line that flattens things out. You know, you see that a lot in, you know, graphic designs or certain illustrations. So it's not like a, a must-have for all artwork. But if your goal is realism and to use line to reinforce a three-dimensional quality, um, you just want to be um, mindful of variation, right? So... The, the more consistency you have in your line, the kind of the flatter and more consistent it is, the, um, the flatter the drawing will be. But I, I just like what's visually what's happening when I drop in, I don't know if we can see it, um, some lines like this. Uh, and so I want to go with it. It's just they're enjoyable marks. And it helps to kind of clarify some of these petals. Um, and I'm going to sneak up on it. I'm not going to define every petal to the same degree. Um, there's going to be a feeling kind of involved with it, which gets a little squishy, right, in terms of trying to describe why I'm making certain decisions. Um, But there's just, this is, you know, I don't know if you've heard that term from artists saying that, you know, they're re responding to what's happening in the artwork. And that's probably the best way I can describe what's happening here. So I'm looking at the, at the drawing, I'm looking at the reference, and I'm letting the marks sometimes um, guide me, like just responding to the marks that I think are interesting for some reason and then looking at the reference to see well what am I learning from the flower that can improve the drawing right and so this is now where we start to get at that stage where you know the suggestion and your your emotional intent becomes a factor like what are you trying to say with this if you if you have something to say and it I've done plenty of drawings where everything I'm, the only thing I'm really trying to say is that this is what this thing looks like. Sometimes I'm trying to create uh, an expression of the atmosphere or the light that is interesting in the scene. Um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, more of a kind of, an expressive thing is just a launching pad for to make abstract marks. But there's there's something in you know building up these hatch marks and the contour lines that I'm finding visually interesting and I want to explore further. Um, where I would get hung up in the past, um, especially in art school, is in feeling like I had to know what I was doing at all times. What is the intention behind the marks that I'm making? And am I clear on that before I make it? Um, and then it took me a while to, to realize that that intention sometimes comes later. Sometimes it comes as a result of simply accepting what's happening in the drawing or the painting, contemplating it, and then finding your kind of voice in that once the, the drawing or painting is done. So hope, I don't know if that is something that any of you connect with, but um, those are just some thoughts. Ooh, I like this. This is, this is a really interesting shape here, so. Um, and there it kind of falls into this negative space. And then there's this cast shadow. So 
know, just kind of thinking a bit more. And uh, I'm recognizing that some of these shapes aren't quite right, but all right. So how's everybody doing? Nia saying one of my art instructors in the past used to yank on my pencil every time I started drawing outlines. I think I have residual trauma from that experience. Yikes. I guess that's one way to do it, but I don't think I would have responded well to that approach. Um, uh, and then this question from Jane is what size is the paper? This is eight by 10 that I'm working on right now. What time is it? Oh, we're, we are over two hours, yikes. I did not realize we were running so long. So let me let me wrap this up. I may have to um, kind of post the finished drawing on Artist Network so you can see how it turns out, but I don't think I'm really doing much you know, fundamentally different now than what I was than what I've been doing. Now is all that kind of the the finishing work. And um, so I'm going to actually have to hop off and join other meetings because I have other work to do today. And that's so frustrating because sometimes I just want to keep drawing. Um, but I am very grateful that I was able to take two hours out of the day to draw with you all. Um, I will, I'm going to keep working on this and I will post this. You'll find a link in the description to the show page and I will post it there when I'm done. And I really hope that you all post yours as well because that is fun to see. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me. And if you're new, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Um, we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to do this. And I look forward to doing many, many more. Now, I've mentioned it before, but I'm kind of in the process of uh, kind of expanding this or kind of transitioning into painting as well as drawing, you know, so maybe it'll be one week we'll be drawing, one week we'll be working on a watercolor, one week we'll be working on an oil painting or something. Um, I've still got some things to resolve for that, so, but it's just on my mind, so if anybody has any thoughts about that, um, I'm open to it because I'd love to hear what you all think. I've heard from many of you that you're interested in watercolor and I have lots to learn. So I figure if I'm gonna learn about this, maybe we can all do that together. How's that sound? So um, again, thank you all for joining me. Um, I wanna wish you a happy rest of the week. Can't wait to see your sunflower drawings. Please share them when you're done. Um, and if you wanna follow me, be sure to like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff so you know when the next one comes. So, all right, 